On today's episode, I spoke with Jay Akunzo about brand residence, high impact content marketing, and podcasting. Jay's a top tier marketer who's worked with companies like ESPN, Google, and HubSpot before going out on his own to do coaching. Now he runs a membership for creators, one-on-one -on -one coaches people, and he writes books and speaks publicly for a living. He is uniquely qualified to talk about resonating through content. So let's dive right into this episode. You obviously help creators through a bunch of different ways. And so creator economy is probably very near and dear to your heart, something you focus on a lot. I'm just curious to get your opinion on what you think the kind of current state of the creator economy is like what's going on, what's working, what's not working. Yeah, I think there's a bright line being drawn among creators today. And by the way, this applies to folks who identify as a creator with a capital C and independent building an audience and earning a living on that audience. This also applies to content marketers, executives and other practitioners showing up in the world to communicate. I mean, this is not unique to just creators in the creator economy, but I think it might be the most potent there. But this bright line separating groups of people, on the one side of the line, you have folks that think it's about creating content. And on the other, you have folks that understand it's actually about creating connection. And so the folks that are really excited about phrases like generate content or, you know, 10x the content at 10x the speed, the folks that are using generative AI tools, not to unblock their imagination, but to outsource it, they think it's all about content. And by the way, I don't, there are a lot of charlatans in that camp, but most people are not that. Most people have good intentions. They're trying to do a hard thing. And I think it's because we were influenced for many years, both in school and in our early careers, to think about content. There's a great director of the writing program over at the University of Chicago. He just retired, Larry McInerney, who talks about this. Like, you're an expert, and so you're creating and thinking and creating, and that produce, produces a text. And your first audience was not using the text in a natural audience-like way because your first audience were your teachers, like literally paid to care about you. And they're using the text, not like an audience uses it to change how they think about the world or execute. They were using your early writing to evaluate whether or not you were in fact an expert. So you get all these people trying to out-expert each other, trying to create, and then you get all these rules about how to do that, how to write clearly and how to organize your thoughts. Is the topic relevant? Let's do some keyword research. Is it structured right? Pixar's 22 rules for storytelling, how to structure a story. None of this stuff is useless, but it is so limiting and it is so not what the audience wants from your content, which is to change something about how they see things, think about things, decide things or execute things, right? That's not how we were taught. So starting from a different place means starting from an area of thinking of this as connection. It's about the connection. It's not about the content. It's about resonance, not just reach. That's this big line dividing camps. And I think you can see the symptoms and the behavior on both sides. I totally agree. And it's interesting to think of this through the creator lens, but also if you translate this to like B2B, let's say, for a B2B brand, how would you recommend that they apply some of these principles of going for connection over just pure content? Because I think that content marketing is what's hammered home right now. But how would you advise like a, an actual brand yeah. to implement that? Think of this as you lack a perspective. Like you're competing on topics, but you don't have a premise. They, like a very simple example is very native to my world is making a show. So I've, I host a podcast called Unthinkable. I have made dozens of pilots and a few series for brands that I've hosted and even more behind the scenes, like working to develop a show with the client, with a brand, Salesforce, GoDaddy, Wistia, companies like that. And in all of my time, either consulting or actually actively creating the content, what I've realized is the most important part of this equation for a show, but also for your overall brand or any project within that is the premise. And the premise can be pitched in a very simple way, but it's really hard to build your way to this nice, neat packaging. The premise is this is a show or insert whatever project you're building about X. Those are your topics. That is not defensible. That is not ownable. There's lots of content about X. This is a show about X. Unlike other shows about X, only we why. And so the why is like the hook. The fill in the blank is the angle, the conceit, the belief system. It's how you explore what you explore, right? So what you explore isn't ownable. And so the way you look at a premise, the de definition of the premise for a show, a project of any kind, or a whole platform is it's the specific defensible purpose for that project pulled from your personal or in this case, organizational perspective for your audience. 
right? So is it specific or generic? A lot of B2B content fails because it's too generic. Is it defensible? Can you own that idea? Because you might niche down and say, we're the first ever podcast about this. But as soon as there's a second one, yeah, you were specific. You might still be, but there's others. Like it's not defensible. That's a moat the size of my finger. It's specific, it's defensible, and it's pulled from your personal or organizational perspective on something, right? Like where we stand as a group, as a community, as an industry is broken. We think we should go that way. And the show, this content, this brand exists to help you move from the status quo to something better. We have a vision for what we're changing for our audience. And that is super potent in B2B because B2B, you speak about their careers, you speak about their businesses, right? That's powerful stuff. There should be a transformation you're pushing, not just a bunch of topics you explore. So the sum up to all this ranting, Blake, is we need to stop trying to out-expert everybody. Like generalized expertise is totally commodified. What you need to do is imbue that expertise with some kind of personal perspective. And the way others access that perspective is through the premise of a show, of a newsletter, of a video series, of a whole brand. That's what we need in B2B. We need to get better at premise development. I like the concept of make, making a show and it almost naturally kind of gears toward thinking of video just because like a show, TV show, whatever. But making that clarification you did that it could also be a newsletter or wh wherever you're telling your story. And you've done this through many different mediums, but I want to talk about podcasts. So for Unthinkable, how did you apply these principles to building Unthinkable from, yep. from the very start? Like, What did that process look like for you differentiating and making it resonate? I think premise development and idea development in general, when you can feel your own frustration with something, that's a great place to start. That's like lighting a match for your creativity. And the object is not to hold the match. That's what most people do on like Twitter is they just light their frustration on fire and hold it and it burns you and it burns others. That's unproductive frustration. But you can turn your frustration with an industry into curiosity. So you go from a match to like lighting some kindling, you know, you start to have a little bit of a fire going here and you're like, all right, with Unthinkable 2016, I'm super frustrated with content marketing because having done it for brands as big as HubSpot, where I was their head of content to tiny little startups and a community group I ran back then for content marketers. I'd seen it all the different ways. And the commonality I saw was this disrespect for the craft and lack of care for craft. It was all about marketing content and the content wasn't very good, right? I was frustrated. I lit my match and then I lit some kindling. Why? Why is all content marketing in a given niche the same? Why is it awful? Why are we not learning from the best in writing and podcasting and video away from marketing? What's going on here? What well, the best practices to do it this way? Why are we obsessed with best practices? It means average. It's all it is, average practice, right? Like what? And all, oh, by the way, the best time to tweet now that's available, that's not the best time to tweet anymore. Like, what are we doing? We're just blending in and creating more sameness. It's never been easier to be average. And I said this in 2016, and arguably that's only gotten worse. You can be mediocre at scale. Congratulations, it's chat GPT. So why are we doing this and who's doing it differently? All these questions emerge when you move from frustration that you have to curiosity, like lighting kindling with that frustration. And then as you give that oxygen, literally aerate your ideas by publishing publicly. For me, it was on a podcast. As you aerate those ideas and you, it's like blowing on the fire, you oxygenate it, you have this roaring fire. And that represents this either distant light that people see and come running your way or this fire that warms a community around you. And so with Unthinkable, it was like, I'm frustrated. Now I'm curious. And over time, I start to figure out, and what is it that we're all curious about? And what are we solving? What is my perspective on that? Okay, I don't know, 25 episodes in, let me re-engineer how I articulate the premise. And now what we say is it's about helping you make the leap from what best practices say you're supposed to do to what your intuition is urging you to try. That seems unthinkable until you hear the people who did it. And they explain it in safe and logical ways. Maybe you should think more like that. Maybe you should think for yourself and trust yourself more than blueprints. That's what Unthinkable is about. It took a while to build there, right? But you can make it process-oriented or system-oriented. What would be your response to somebody that looks at your approach and how you've just described this and says, yeah, but I can't go viral that way? Yeah, sure. To what end? Why are you going viral? Like if you, why, like the, I have a toddler, so her sitting in the back of the car asking why I try my damnedest not to get frustrated to actually encourage that because I know it's a healthy behavior and a useful one in life, like for your job, for school, for everything. And so I'm trying to foster that, not get frustrated and be like, because I said so. But she's asking all the right questions in that she's asking one question. Why? So you want to go viral. Why? So we get a bunch of followers. Why? 
So we get a bunch of attention. Why? You just keep going to lie. And eventually you get down to the fact that marketing is just about two things. It's earning trust and inspiring action. That's it. That's all this is. And when people want to go viral, I think what actually is happening is they're asking people to take an action and it's not working out. And so they think, well, if a million people were aware of us, that would solve our problems. But awareness is just a proxy for what you actually want, which is affinity. Like your reach doesn't matter if you don't resonate. You know, from resonance comes action. It's literally like in the sciences, think about vibrating frequencies that have a similar frequency or wavelength. Those are resonant frequencies. It's about alignment. And then what happens in the sciences is those two systems experience an energy transfer. So back in the creative world, if what you're saying and the way you're saying it and the premise of how you're saying it, all that stuff aligns deeply with someone else's lived experience, all of a sudden their thoughts, their feelings, even their abilities feel amplified like you have amplified and they go, oh my gosh, this, and they pick you and stick with you and share you against the odds, right? So the pinnacle of that experience of resonating with someone else is they go, well, I know Blake has a bigger show than Jay, but Jay's is my favorite. That's what we want, that irrational emotional bias in our favor because they pick you and stick with you against the odds. Yes, I love that. <laughs> if you were to kind of look at what you've just said there, are there clear examples of any companies that are kind of doing this right where they're putting out content, but you don't feel like they're really trying to game the system or anything. They're just genuinely being helpful and interesting. It's really hard to look at this from a whole, like that company all the time in general, right? Because like there's so many factors that weaken your approach when you do something potent once. There's so many stakeholders. I think what we're doing is we're moving beyond the world of the logo is where the trust flows. I mean, you're seeing this with B2B brand handles, right? Are you more likely to follow that executive or that practitioner or that marketer who is saying meaningful things as a representative of the brand and engage with them or their corporate handle, their corporate page? I mean, think of LinkedIn. Are you following more people or logos, right? So we all say like, well, people trust people, not logos, but we have to extrapolate out that the who behind the content matters more than ever before. And so there's not like companies, you know, I think about people, I think about Michelle Warner, who is an executive coach or more so, I guess she's consulting businesses, entrepreneurial, creative entrepreneurs who are trying to build tiny but mighty companies. And we just did an episode called Speakeasy Business. Is it possible to thrive in business today getting off the social feeds? Like what if you actually went that far to bet on resonance? Well, Michelle has a marketing model that allows her to do that. Turns out it's not her own. There's a lot of people who have similar models, but she's codified it. She's helped us rethink it, right? So she is consistently showing up in line with her values, resonating with an audience that is growing disillusioned with social media, that can't stand the fact that we talk about going viral and all their crap like that. And Michelle is very thoughtfully saying, I agree, and there's a different way. And she's helping people with her stories. And she's helping people with her methodologies. And she's helping people with her one-to-one -one consulting. So I think of someone like her, or I think of, you know, if you think of a brand, you might think of like, for years and years, Wistia has been standing up and saying, we want to make business more human, right? And oh, by the way, we think the way to do that is do more video and we're partnering with this other organization and they think of it slightly differently. They solve 5% of the problem and CEO Chris Savage would readily admit that. But what Wistia has continued to do is find more and more ways to put their people at the center of it all, right? Through behind the scenes videos, through allowing their head of production to actually have a voice publicly as a thought leader in video and not just be somebody behind the scenes who you don't know exists and doing documentaries showing the process of developing different videos with different budgets and trying to declare a winner you know they did a documentary called 110 100 they made the same ad with three different budget levels and they talked about how it all went it was an incredible exercise in putting people at the center with a great premise of whether or not you can actually declare that, okay, more budget hurts creativity, less budget actually helps it. So they're a company that's been doing it for a while, but even they've had their moments of like churning the screws too hard to try and grow too fast and you forget who they are and you just see a logo. So I think the sum up of this rant here is the more you empower your people to understand the premise, first of all, you need one, but as you have that premise or brand story, let's say, it's nice that it sounds good on the homepage. It's nice that it's in this deck that you or a consultant gave the brand. The most important thing, though, is that you bring that story to market. And that's where your people need to be effective storytellers. So I think gone are the days of me going, that company does it well. 
And I'm all about what people do it well and what can we learn from them. I do want to touch on AI here, although... I'm sorry, what is it? AI. AI. What does that stand for? Artificial intelligence. Artificial. That's interesting. I've heard of that. (laughs) (laughs) I want to talk through an an interesting lens here of kind of blends into what you're thinking. So everybody's kind of using it now for different things. And some people believe it can do everything. Some people believe it can do nothing. Some people fall kind of in between. But what's the cutoff? So if the goal is resonance, if the goal is to tell like a genuine story, it is blatantly obvious that AI cannot take you all the way there. So I'm curious what the cutoff for you would be on like, all right, I can trust it to do like one or two, these one or two things, but then it's cut off and I take over from there. Yeah. What's the cutoff for using a hammer? I don't know if carpenters sit around agonizing over how to use hammers in their work, right? Because you have to know what you're trying to build. And I think that's a big part of the problem is historically, a lot of marketers don't know what they stand for. They don't have premises. We don't know what we're trying to build. What's the editorial mission? Who is it for? What is it for? How will we know it's working? We don't have these things clear in our minds. So we just lurch from trend to trend, tool to tool. AI is a tool. It's only as good as the person wielding it. So I can't tell you it's good for this, that, or the other thing. Because in the hands of a master chef, a knife can be very many things and do very many things. The same knife. You put that in my hands, I'm chopping off the tips of my finger, right? But not when it comes to creating content, because I think I'm better at creating content than, you know, being in a Michelin star chef's kitchen. Anyways, analogy over. I think that the most important realization that we can have, like my chief concern, I'll phrase it this way, the problem that we're seeing with generative AI and marketers and creative people is not that the bots are going to create a problem for us. The bots are not going to replace creators. The problem is creators, a lot of them, act like bots. That's the problem I see. And when you act like a bot, what you're doing is you're over-indexing on process. It's the workflow, the techniques and the tools that you can use to guide the work. And often we're letting them guide the work for us, right? Even my dog is fired up about this problem. That's the big takeaway here. Even the animal kingdom is like, stop acting like bots, creative people. You're people. Also give me a treat. No, there's two other parts to mastery that goes beyond process. Process can be handed to you. Process can come from a tool or something else. Posture. How do you see yourself in the world? What's your creative fingerprints? Can you get it all over the work? And practice. Are you actually showing up on a recurring basis to get better? Like having a writing practice doesn't mean you're going viral and seeing revenue. Having a writing practice means you're practicing. You're showing up and shipping and getting better all the time. And that allows you to explore all the messy bits that make your work uniquely you. So if you can imbue your work with the things that make it uniquely yours and not just anyone else's, then AI is your intern. Have at it, my friend. Wrestle with your ideas with it. Create messy outlines. Ask questions to see what the moderate or median thing that here's the English major trying to wade into statistics. The average approach sounds like and then don't do it that way. Great. AI is your intern because you can imbue it with the things that make it uniquely yours. But if you're producing pieces that look like or sound like anything in your space, like we can get that information anywhere and you happen to be anywhere, then AI might be your replacement. And so I have no tolerance for people that are outsourcing their imagination to this tool. To skip the messy part of the creation process is to skip the thinking part. What we ought to be doing is finding where specifically we feel blocked. And then if we need a tool, it's there, right? And there are myriad tools of which AI is just one. So can we please, for the love of God, stop obsessing over a tool? I am much less interested in what a tool can do than what Blake can do. Love it. Two, two final questions, kind of more rapid fire, and then we'll close things out here. Appreciate your time as always. On the freelance side, so you're not necessarily freelance right now, but you've been on your own for a while. You've been doing yes. coaching, you've been doing speaking, you've done all these different things. You've been on your own, developing relationships, going that route. If you're just looking at that as like freelancing in general, just being away from an in-house role, why do you think more talented people are kind of going toward that route now as opposed to in-house? I think, and this is, if I could give any talk to like college students and high school students, it might be about this premise, but in your career, I think control and certainty are inversely proportional to each other where the more control you have, the less certainty, and the more certainty you have, the less control. So on the extremes, if you want total control, start a brand new company today. And then as you grow, you start to trade off some of your control for certainty, like repeatable systems or contractors or a co-founder, et cetera. 
And on the other end of the spectrum, you have what's total certainty. And historically, I think that was like, go work for a high flying, fancy sounding brand. Salesforce at one moment in time, Google at one moment in time, you know, Uber at another moment in time, you name the company here, OpenAI right now. You want total certainty, go work for this massive organization, flush with capital, lots of talent, they're established, you know where your paycheck's coming from, et cetera. And I think what's happening right now is the world is waking up to the fact that largely the promise of total certainty from large organizations was a lie. Where the people who are most protected are actually the people who understand how to control their schedule, how to control their day, how to control where the paycheck comes from, how to control how they show up in the world as irreplaceable talents, not cogs in a machine, which by the way, here comes a tool and you're out. So historically, it was like, I always saw those things as be an independent, be an employee. And the further out you go, it's like be an employee at a bigger company, more certainty. Be an independent at a you know, first day thing that you just started, more control. And I think what we're seeing is there was an illusion sold to us that you are safe here, that you are valued here, that you're part of the quote unquote family here at large organizations. And especially in tech, that has proven to be, you know, it's demonstrably false. Last one here. This one's a softball, so sh shouldn't be a problem for you at all. Okay. But I just want to hear your tech stack because you've got this interesting business helping creators. Yeah. Just want to know what you're using to actually set up the infrastructure to give an idea of how much it takes or how little it takes to do what you do. For sure. I run all of my, so my newsletter is on ConvertKit. My podcast is back end is Simplecast. Front end to record is Riverside. Social media, I use no tools besides the native apps. I don't do any sort of paid promotion of my work. Honestly, the two most important apps that I have at my disposal, one is called Go For A Walk. Do you know this one, Blake? Go for Okay, so Go no. For A Walk is when you need ideas or you need a reframing or you need a brainstorm session and you go for a walk. That's one of the tools I most use. It's not technology. It's literally using your legs to go for a walk. That's one tool I use and will die on all the time. And then the other is called, I believe the French call it the note book or Italian. I think it's a no, <laughs> no, in Italian. It's a note book. I'm Italian, so I can do that horrible accent. So I have my note books right here. God, I can't believe I'm doing that to my ancestors. I have a little notebook, which is all my to-dos, documentation of like what's happening in my day. Then I have these giant notebooks. I'm literally throwing up in front of the camera here, massive notebooks where I diagram heuristics and new projects and all that stuff. If I couldn't go for a walk and couldn't write in a notebook, my entire business would collapse because I am nothing if not my ideas. I mean, that's what people are buying from me is my stories and my ideas. Those are my products and anything you use to access that stuff, my podcast, my newsletter, paid clients like coaching or my membership, those are features of my core product, which is my ideas, what's between my ears and how I articulate that stuff. So yeah, I would say that we are over-indexed on tools almost all the time and under-indexed on exerting this mushy thing in between our temples.